Now, uh, the passage I was going to use today is from Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. It's interesting, the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. And uh, kind of relates to our, our Bible. We have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament. Um, how many books are there in the Old Testament? 27. What is it? 27? 27? No. Okay, is she right? No, it's 39. Who said 39? 39? Okay. Does that sound right? <laughs> All right, let's try our little math out. How about the New Testament? How many? Uh, 27? You just got mixed up with the old and the new, right? <laughs> All right. Someone add 27 and 39. 66. Isn't it interesting? Isaiah has 66 chapters. And from 40 on to 60 to 66, in the first part of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters, deals with the judgment of God. That's what it deals with. From chapters 40 to the chapter 66, the theme is the comfort of God. Isn't that interesting? Just like the Old and the New Testament. So, the Lord led me to chapter 40. Comfort ye, you comfort, he says, you comfort my people, saith your God. Would you say in our day we need a little bit of a comfort situation? Do we need some comfort? Now, some background is important here to understand what has been going on. Uh, one of the longer reigns in the, of, of the people of Judah was a king by the name of Uzziah. You remember that guy, Uzziah? Uh, chapter 6, remember Isaiah saw a vision of our Lord in the year that King Uzziah died. Remember that? King Uzziah. Now, to go back in history, the, the, the Jewish kingdom had split. And you remember, you had the northern kingdom called Israel, and then you had the southern kingdom called Judah. And they split. And the northern kingdom, they had a series, I believe it was 21 straight wicked kings. 21 straight which is not going to help any nation. But they did. And then Assyria, that was a nation that was in, going in those days, took Israel, the northern kingdom, into captivity in 722 B.C. So Israel was taken captive, the northern kingdom, and the, its people were spread about. Hoshea was the last king of Israel. And in the 14th year of Hezekiah, he was a king of the southern kingdom, Judah, and this is from Isaiah 36, verse 1. Sennacherib, he was a king of Assyria, attacked Judah. But God intervened. I don't know if you remember the account. I'm not going to look it up right now, but God intervened and Judah was spared at that time. God can intervene. I believe that. So Isaiah was given an extra 15 years. God said that he was going to die and then he requested the Lord an additional time to live. Remember that account? And he got 15 extra years, and he, he reigned until 686 B.C. 
And while in that extra 15 year period, Hezekiah did something he probably wished he hadn't done. Hezekiah overall was a man who had faith in God. But he showed his kingdom to what to the people, to what people group? To what nation? It was the Babylonians. Their chiefs of state came in and he showed them, and he said there was nothing that he didn't show of what he had. And the people from Babylonia that came in and looked at everything and they put, tucked it in the back of their mind and said, we've got them on our list now. But Hezekiah showed them everything. And it would come back to bite the nation of Judah. Isaiah 39. Uh, there was the prophecy of the Babylonian invasion and, and the captivity of the nation of Judah. Isaiah 39 verses 5 to 8, which I'm not going to read. And this prophetic message and the Babylonian invasion was given a hundred years before it happened. One hundred years before it happened. It was prophesied that Babylonia would come in and take over Judah. One hundred years. I don't know if you remember the account where it says, well, um, Hezekiah was kind of relieved at the time because he was not going to have to face the invasion. And he was kind of relieved. But down the road, there would be the invasion and the captivity. And then comes, that was chapter 39, and then chapter 40 comes the comforting prophetic message. Inspired by God to Isaiah the prophet, a message of comfort. God gave this message of comfort 100 years before they needed it. Isn't that amazing? But this is what the message of comfort is. And then in this message of comfort, it looks forward to who? The coming of the Messiah. In that message. God always knows what he's doing. And so when he inspired Isaiah of this message of comfort, it would be used to the people of Judah who would be taken captive by the Babylonians. And just try to picture when that invasion took place. By the way, there was three Babylonian invasions and it was the third invasion of which they conquered them. They destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. But it was the third invasion. But pictures, and then they took people and they marched them to Babylon. No modern transportation, by the way. And they took them. Imagine being taken out of your country and being brought to another place. I'm sure they were not treated very well. And so here are the words of comfort. And for some reason, the Lord placed this uh, passage on my mind for this morning. Because I believe all of us could use a message of comfort. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. Cry out to her. The warfare is ended. The warfare is going to come to a conclusion. Her iniquity is pardoned. Her lawlessness is pardoned. What a message of comfort. And we who have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, 
We have that message. Your sins have been forgiven. Isn't that wonderful? Your sins have been forgiven. Past, present, and future sins washed away through the blood of Christ. What a comfort. And in spite of what goes on in our world, we have that assurance that when we take our last breath here, we're going to go into the very presence of God. Comfort ye. Comfort ye, my people. And in this message, the Lord says, He says, You have received from the Lord's hand double for all your sins. That's a very interesting statement. I wonder if it doesn't go back to where the Lord said, To whom much is given, much is required. You know, the people of Israel had spirituality or the spiritual things of this of, of, from God. They had it handed to them on a silver platter, didn't they? They had everything. They watched God's deliverance through the Red Sea experience. God delivered them eventually from the slavery from Egypt. They watched God work. And yet, many persisted in their sin. And according to this, they had got double for all their sins. They were punished by God because they disobeyed him. Uh, every individual has to make a decision. I'm going to live for the Lord. In spite of what's going on around me, in spite of the fact that there might not be many people who are trusting in the Lord, in spite of the fact that sin is all around me, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to live for Christ in spite of what's going on around me. Have you made that decision? Amen. See? That's what we have to do. I'm going to live for Him no matter what's going on around me. And so... The purpose of this passage given through the prophet Isaiah is to comfort the afflicted and the oppressed people of God. He did not forsake them. They went through a lot of punishment. But in the end, he didn't forsake them. There was a righteous remnant that came out of the Babylonian captivity and went back to their homeland. Jerusalem, its capital, is in ruins at that time. Then you have the books of Nehemiah, books of Ezra, which the, the wall was rebuilt and the temple was rebuilt. Who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messenger, who, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. To the cities of Judah, he says, you shall be built. I will raise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. God raised up Cyrus. And he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. Hope is given for the nation of Israel. For he will comfort Zion. He will comfort all our waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden. And her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and voice of melody. Break forth into joy. Sing together your waste places of Jerusalem. Can you imagine the joy as the captive people came back to Jerusalem? That remnant. What joy that was. God had been working. For the Lord has comforted his people, Isaiah 52, 9. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. From among you shall be built the old waste places. You shall raise, raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 12. Because we're trusting in the Lord, we have hope. We have hope. We hope in Him, 
in him. The only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's where our hope lies in, in him. In him. The land of Israel was waste and desolate. Your holy people have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down your sanctuary. Isaiah 63, verse 18. The city of Jerusalem and the temple have been destroyed. Your holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and beautiful temple where our fathers praised you is burned up with fire. And all our pleasant things are laid waste. Isaiah chapter 64. Very depressing time for Israel. But there's hope in the Lord. There's a passage in the book of uh, Psalm, Psalm 119. And I love this little prayer. It, uh, it cries out, Oh Lord, it's time for you to work. Would you say it's time for God to work? Huh? Oh, Lord, please work. By the way, this was the passage of Scripture that was used for Handel's Messiah. The context of it was that Isaiah was directed by God to give words of consolation and comfort to the oppressed Jews who had been in captivity for a long time. Seventy years is a long time. 70 years is the normal lifetime of one person. Remember in Psalm 90 it talks about if you, uh, 70 years is kind of the, the time that you might live. And uh, if you live beyond that, additional strength is given. 70. So myself, I'm on borrowed time right now. I'm 77. So. But God is good. Every day you get is, it's from him, right? Every day. It's from him. So for the children of Israel, that 70 year, there were people maybe that were born at the beginning of that and they maybe died when they were 70. They were always in captivity. 70 years. Yeah. So Isaiah has given the people a message. The Jewish people have hope their land would be restored. In Isaiah 60, verse 10, the sons of foreigners shall build up your walls and their king shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I've had mercy on you. Isaiah 60, verse 10. There is a believing remnant in our world today. You and I are part of that believing remnant of believers in Jesus Christ. We may not be many, but we are that believing remnant. And God, throughout history, has shown favor to the believing remnant. God will not forsake his people. Does that mean we don't go through tough times? No, we may have to. But God will not forsake his people. He didn't forsake the Jewish people who had turned totally against him. Remember uh, uh, Elijah? He, uh, <laughs> he said, Lord, they've Dug, uh, they've not listened to the prophets. They've ignored. They, they went into idolatry. And, and Elijah was really depressed one day. Can you remember a day in your life where you really were depressed? You didn't see any hope anywhere. I think that was Isaiah or uh, Elijah. Remember what he said? He said, Lord, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one. He said, I don't know of any other believers. I'm it. And what did the Lord tell him? Someone, someone tell me what he said. What? He said, there's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Well, where these 7,000 were? Apparently, Elijah didn't know who they were. But you know what? We sometimes feel we're all alone. But maybe there's some believers here and there, do you think? There's some believers around. And he got so depressed, 
he was under what was it the sycamore tree is that the one he he just kind of said i've had it i'm done <laughs> i don't know which way to turn but god worked in elijah's heart and god used him but it was a time where everything looked bleak god said there's seven thousand others and we're going to, in, in our world, we're going to come across some other believers, aren't we? And they're going to encourage us. And hopefully we'll encourage them through these times. The Jews were restored to their land after 70 years. He says, I'll bring, I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah and Arab, my mountains, my elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Isaiah 65, verse 9. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Apparently that's the message that God wanted me to give today to maybe comfort our hearts and give us some encouragement. God's message to Isaiah was very much to the point. He said the captivity will come to an end. Brighter days are coming. Would you like to hear that one? Brighter days are coming. <laughs> Maybe the best approach we should take is right where we are, the time that God gives us, to be encouraged about the very, the very days God gives us and to be encouraged rather than be discouraged. Keep looking up to the Lord. I... I've said to my wife different times, I said, you know, I, I don't even like to look at the news anymore. I don't know about you. Do you like looking at it? I'm kind of tired of it. I think it depresses a person if you spend too much time on it. I know we need to know a little bit what's going on. But as I go on, I want to know very little bit. <laughs> right. But I'm saying it can depress you to just hear this constant barrage of uh, depressing type of news. And... When we read this book, what do we get? We get the total opposite, don't we? The total opposite. Encouragement. He said, your time of affliction, your warfare is about to end. Isaiah was commanded to preach the comfort to God's people. Speak comfortably to my people. Don't speak harshly to my people. They were a source of comfort to them. In the midst of their distress, they heard... Words of comfort. There's no other book like the Bible that, to bring, that will bring comfort for you. God's Word will bring comfort. Some wonderful assurances. Think of the comfort of a passage like Psalm 23, which we've heard and known, but the comfort that that brings. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'm there with you through it all. God's word brings refreshment, refreshment, lessening the stress. God says, I'm going to help you, Israel. I'm going to help you, Judah. You're going to eventually come out of that, and I'm going to be with you. Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. The old the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated in this day shall be carried to Babylon. And nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will be kept. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. But then the Lord says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Tuck this message away, he says, because in a hundred years you will be experiencing that comfort. Okay, let's uh, bow together for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God because it is our source of comfort. It is our source of encouragement. And forgive us for times where we don't look to your word. We get caught up in so many different things. Somehow lay your word aside. So Lord, thank you for your care for us. We thank you that 
We're told in 1 Peter 5, 7 to cast all our care upon you because you care for us. May we cast ourselves upon you in these days in which we live. And may we receive the comfort that you have promised. Be with the believing remnant wherever they are in our present world. Help them be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And we'll thank you for what you're going to do. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.